Welcome to the Peel Leaders Debate. My name is Michael A. Chervon, brought to you by Brampton Focus on Facebook Live Town Hall. Well, as you know, June 7th, there's an election happening. And in the Peel region currently, uh, there's seven liberal seats, nine in total, that are sitting in the legislature. Seven liberal seats, one progressive conservative, which is in the Caledon area, and one former NDP seat, which is vacant. Well, that's uh, Jagmeet Singh, who is now the current leader of the federal NDP party. In 2018, the stakes are much larger in the Peel region because the number of seats are going up in the legislature. It's going from 107 to 124. Mississauga will receive uh, one new seat with a total of six. Brampton will receive two new seats with a total of four. That means that the Peel region uh, will have 12 seats in the Ontario legislature. So 1.4 million people basically control 10% of the Ontario legislature. As of May 12th, the current uh, poll tracker numbers, which is maintained by CBC, puts the progressive conservatives of Doug Ford at 41.5%, the NDP in second place with 27.1%, the Liberals in third place, 249 and the Green Party at 5.1%. Now, in April, our folks here at Brampton Focus decided to announce to the, all the leaders that we were going to have a leadership debate. And we contacted all the mayors. We contacted the mayors in the Peel region because obviously the Peel region has an effect on the mayors and we wanted them to pose questions. So we contacted Bonnie Crombie, who has submitted us two questions. Linda Jeffrey has submitted us two questions to ask. And Alan Thompson, the guy who cares, the man from Caledon, not only did he submit two questions, but Alan Thompson is here with us today, sitting and watching in the studio, and is going to pose his questions live as we move along. Uh, interestingly enough, there, was, uh, there have been several debates that have gone on. Uh, June 8th, you had the uh, Black Community Provincial Debate. May 7th was City TV's debate, which was very well attended. And May 11th was the debate in Perry Sound. And the final televised television debate is slated for May 27th on CBC. The one interesting po a component of all that is each of the parties, they said, were represented. Three parties were representative, the Conservatives, the Liberals, and the NDP, and one party was not, and that was the Green Party. Well, here at Brampton Focus, we believe if you build it, they will come. Uh, many of them didn't, but one did. Mike Schreiner is here today with us from the Ontario Green Party to sit and talk with us and discuss uh, the debate in the upcoming election. Mike, thank you so much for joining us here today. Michael, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm just wondering where the other three podiums and seats are. Well, you know, sometimes they say, Mike, that it's more more dangerous to participate in a debate and say nothing than it is. Um, I, I, we will admit we're not televised in a sense over conventional television, yeah. but we are the future, and the future is all about streaming. A brand of focus and incubator for a political mm. commentary. We have a, a pretty good track record, I would say. I've had the opportunity to interview both of you mm. and all the leaders except Doug Ford. I, I did... Uh, um, everybody with respect to who was running, but I guess, you know, they have more important things. I guess the 1.1 um, million people in, uh, in the region of Peel are uh, not necessarily on their agenda today, but you are, so I want to thank Absolutely. No, my pleasure. I should correct one thing. I did participate in the Black Community Provincial did you? Debate. I'm sorry. They invited all four leaders. Unfortunately, Mr. Ford declined to participate in that one. But the Premier, Andrew Horvath, and I participated in that debate. Well, I appreciate you correcting Absolutely. me on that. We always want to be uh, right. Um, what I wanted to ask you was off the top. When you watch those debates, I mean, the City TV uh, debate was well uh, was well attended. Right. Uh, the one at Perry Sound as well. Yeah. How did you feel being one of the leaders of, of a major party here? With um, You've got 124 people running in this That's election. Right, you had 107 slate. in the 2014. Yep. Um, how did you feel when you weren't included in the party? Well, first of all, we've run a full slate of candidates in every election since 2003, running a full slate again in this election, and we're proud to have 52% of our candidates be women. Uh, in terms of being excluded from the first leaders' debate, televised one, the city one, I felt like I won the debate by not being there. Uh, anybody who watched that gong show of a debate will tell you that that debate shows you why people are so sick and tired of the political status quo in Ontario. You had three status quo, quo political leaders, all spending more time tearing each other down than talking about how they would build Ontario up. And I asked people to go to my Twitter feed. I live uh, video recorded answers to each one of the questions. And you know, I gave, I feel like, straightforward, honest answers that 
answered the questions, told people how we would act on the issues mm -hmm. that they were concerned about, rather than spending my time tearing down another leader. It was interesting in the Toronto, uh, Toronto Star, Martin Cohen wrote, he said that televised leaders' debates uh, underpin our democracy by forcing the majority of party leaders to face each other on stage as voters watch them up close. Except when they can't, he says. Uh, when television networks take it upon themselves to cherry pick which leaders they can come on stage and which parties should be arbitrarily excluded, they do a disservice to our democracy. Martin Cohen in Toronto Star, right on point. Um, I want to congratulate you for uh, getting your numbers up. I mean, you've got uh, right now poll tracker, uh, they listed just over 5% and right. growing. Um, you today actually released uh, your party platform, right. uh, which was uh, very cool. Uh, the signature piece of the party's platform is to plan to embrace the 21st century with a clean economy by supporting jobs, uh, clean tech, advanced manufacturing, and $4.18 in green building and business program. Now, you broke it down into three main pillars. Yes. You had jobs, people, and planet. Absolutely. So you have three elements in each one. So let's just go by each pillar here. Uh, in jobs, you said you want to leap into the clean economy, creating jobs in a clean, innovative economy, make our homes and businesses more efficient and more energy efficient. It's simple, save money and save energy. Mm -hmm. And finally, in the, the last tier uh, element is support jobs in your community, lower payroll taxes, or small local business and nonprofits. Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's absolutely essential for Ontario to leap in to the clean economy now. That's where the job growth is. I'm a big believer in skating to where the puck is going, mm -hmm. not where it has been. Already in Canada, 274,000 Canadians work in the clean energy sector with an average salary of $92,000 a year. More people work in clean energy than work in the oil sands. So that is where the job growth is. Globally, $6 trillion opportunity in the low carbon economy. If we even capture 1% of that in Ontario, that's a bigger contributor to our GDP than the auto sector. Those are where the jobs are. That is why the Green Party is going to invest in supporting mm -hmm. businesses who embrace clean innovation and who want to scale up and commercialize clean innovation products so we can be a global leader. The second pillar of your platform, which was announced today, is on people. So you want to unlock housing so everyone has a place that they can afford and call home. And you would like to require all the new developments have at least 20% affordable houses. You want to provide everyone access to mental health services, making mental health services a part of OHIP. And finally, make sure that no one falls through the cracks, implementing a basic home income guarantee for all Ontarians. Yes, so first of all, housing affordability is a huge issue. I mean, anybody in Southern Ontario realizes that it is increasingly becoming less and less affordable for people to afford to have a place to call home, and we have to do something about it. So we have a three-part plan. First of all, adopt international best practices of inclusionary housing laws around the world. We've looked at what they've done in the United States and Europe. Uh, any new development, townhouse, rental unit, condo, subdivision, would have a minimum of 20% of the housing units under uh, market price. Um, that would ramp up housing supply for particularly young professionals and well, young middle-class families. What about, what about families. the developer, though, when you're, when you're forcing them? When yeah, you're yeah, so great question, Michael. So what oftentimes is done in the U.S. and Europe is the developers provide it with a density bonus. So they can uh, add a few extra units to cover the cost of the affordable units mm -hmm. that they're putting in. So it's a win-win for everyone. But the key element here is, is to increase the available supply of affordable housing, particularly for young families. Secondly, we need to make sure we continue to invest more in supportive housing, um, shelters, co-op housing, and social housing. More people in Ontario are on a waiting list to access social housing than the actual number of social housing yeah. units available. So we've been pro we're proposing over $200 million investment over the next four years to ramp up the stock. And that would really be targeted to the people who are most vulnerable. And then finally, let's get innovative with housing. In, on, in Toronto alone, there are potentially 40,000 laneway housing units available. I talk to so many young people who want to live in tiny homes. I talk to people who want secondary yeah. suites. I talk to seniors who want to be a part of co-housing and have granny suites. 
we could significantly ramp up um, our availability of affordable housing supply just by utilizing our existing building and housing stock better by getting rid of the planning and bylaws that prevent that kind of innovation from happening. That is a low cost way of doing it so we don't always have to build up or build out. So talk to me a little bit about uh, the guaranteed uh, basic income. Uh, your really? party is the only one that's actually announced. It's very unique. Yes. The unfortunate reality is some would say that our budget, we're looking at $350 billion at the end of 2018, yes. 2019. How are you going to afford this? Yeah, well, first of all, we live in a changing economy. And you know what? We're seeing increasing numbers of people in precarious work, temporary work, a lot more people in freelance uh, work, a lot more entrepreneurs starting their own business. And so our social assistance programs need to keep up with the time so no one falls through the cracks. Providing people with basic income security and economic security creates the foundation in which they can then become entrepreneurs or freelancers or whatever. So it's an important part of our economy, but it's also important in addressing poverty. So in order to put a down payment on moving to a basic income guarantee, we're proposing an immediate increase in social assistance rates to the current basic income pilot project for all Ontarians. That would cost about $3.4 billion. How we would pay for it is we would cancel the Liberals' unfair hydro plan, which is costing about $3.4 billion. Mm -hmm. And in the long term, actually, is going to be a huge cost to Ontario. The Financial Accountability Officer is saying that over the next two decades, it could cost anywhere between 45 and 93 billion dollars. That's mm. money that should go to health care, should go to education, should go to better social service, should go to paying down the debt. Yeah. Um, and so by doing, the, by, by canceling that program and putting the resources for the people who are most vulnerable, that'll be good for our economy, it'll be good for our communities, and it will also start taking stress off of our health care system because one of the biggest determinants of poverty. health is poverty. Uh, your final uh, pillar here is uh, planet. And uh, you want to get back uh, to the basics and get back to the basics being right for our province. Protect the air, protect the water, and protect our farmland. Uh, you want to set Ontario on a pathway to 100% renewable energy mm -hmm. and getting, uh, getting you home faster, paving the way for public transit, infrastructure and services that we need. This is the final piece of your pillar. That's a big chunk. Absolutely. Well, I mean, first of all, when we talk about increasing affordable housing, we can do it without opening the green belt up for development. Mm -hmm. And I know Mr. Ford has backtracked on his backroom deal with developers to open up the green belt for development. There is plenty of land available for Ontario to develop uh, and grow at least over the next two decades without opening the green belt up. As somebody who grew up on a farm, and I recognize the value of food and farming to our economy. In the whole food and farming sector, 740,000 jobs, about $45 billion to our GDP. We cannot afford to pave over the asset base of all of that wealth. Mm -hmm. So we are saying we have to permanently protect our prime farmland uh, so we can continue to grow food right. for you know now and in the future. And we should expand the green belt to include the blue belt to protect our river systems because that drinking water is essential to life. You're watching Live Town Hall. My name is Michael A. Sherbone. This is a live and interactive show. We ask you to go to facebook.com forward slash Live Town Hall and you can ask Mike Schreiner, the leader of the Ontario Green Party, a question. Uh, I'm going to take the advantage of you talking about uh, the Green Belt. There was a lot of discussion about yes, the Green Belt. Absolutely. And uh, as we stated in this debate, we invited all the mayors of Peel to come and ask questions. We have questions from Madam Mayor Bonnie Cromie from Mississauga, Madam Mayor Linda Jeffrey from Brampton, and we have with us uh, Alan Thompson. You are one of those guys who is on the green belt, as, as are you, Mike Schreiner. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're from Guelph. Oh, Guelph, just so, outside. So when we talk about people who are the stewards of the green belt, you two guys really are the key <laughs> to all this. Um, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you, Alan. And first of all, I thank you very much for being here today. I, I know that you're busy. Um, what is your question for Mike with regards to the green belt, or or your your, your statement with regards how Caledon will be affected? Well, Caledon's already protected. Eighty exactly. percent of Caledon's already protected. We're done uh, mm -hmm. as far as protection. Uh, we have the Oak Ridges Marine with the Niagara Escarpment. Our green belt in Caledon is bigger than the city of Toronto. Exactly. That's yeah. just how big area we have. Yeah. We do have the remainder for future growth, and I That's think the right. challenge is, uh, as much as residential drives, it doesn't pay the freight. We have mm -hmm. to have employment. Yep. And the challenge is, before any of that future land does get developed, we've got to make sure we've got adequate 
employment land exactly. to keep our farmers and everybody sustainable or they're gone. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the real challenge that we do but have. But will we not have to develop some of the green belt? No, no, no. We're, we're fine. I think oh, what yeah. Alan is saying is we have to make sure not only do we have residential development in the areas that are slated for development, but that we also have land designated Protected. for employment as well for commercial, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm gonna let you ask your first question. Yeah, so to follow up, you know, the biggest challenge we have is gridlock. Everybody yes, can't absolutely. get to work. Uh, we're finding the cost of uh, downtown office buildings, people trying to get to work, so we can get people working from home. The big challenge mm -hmm. is broadband. Yes. Inadequate broadband uh, is not an essential service. I guess my first question, would you make it an essential service so that it forces everybody to share? Uh, what I mean by that is, when it's not essential, it basically is if GM built the 401 is only GM cars can drive on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right now, to make it a public process, it's got to be essential. Yeah, absolutely. So, Alan, the Green Party absolutely ex um, supports rolling out broadband internet across Ontario, especially in rural regions that are currently underserviced. And if you think about it, broadband today is like electricity in the yeah. 20th century. Yeah. So we decided electricity was a central public service. We rolled out um, access to the grid, access to electricity, communities all across Ontario. The equivalent of that in the 21st century is broadband. broadband. Yep. And a lot of people don't realize increasingly, farmers in particular, like you, like a lot of the new equipment, if you don't have broadband, <laughs> the equipment doesn't even work. Yeah. So it's not even, so, it, so it's for farming, but it's also, you're absolutely right, we need more people telecommuting, working from home, not having to spend, you know, 80 minutes in a vehicle every day. That could be time they spend working or time they spend with family or volunteering in their community. Uh, so it's a great way to take cars off the road and increase productivity. Yeah. You're watching a live town hall. It's the Peel's Leader Debate. Uh, we're here with Mike Schreiner, the leader of the Green Party, and also Alan Thompson, the mayor of Calden, dropped in for a question. You can reach us at Live Town Hall at Facebook.com forward slash Live Town Hall. We do have a question from Simon. As Simon asks of Mike Schreiner, he said, What's your policy on reducing government debt? I mean, yeah. we're looking at $350 billion, <laughs> are, $40 absolutely. million dollars a month. Yes. Yes, Simon, great question. So here's the fear I have in Ontario right now, is you have the Liberals and the NDP spending, 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 and not telling you how they're gonna pay for it. And you have the Conservatives saying, we're gonna cut taxes, we're gonna cut taxes, we're gonna cut taxes, and not telling you how they're gonna pay for that either. I think both approaches are fiscally irresponsible. And so Greens are talking about ways that we can both save money and ways we can raise additional revenue. And we wanna have an honest conversation with you about that. And I know that's tough in today's political world because politicians don't wanna to talk to you about how they would raise money and they don't wanna to talk to you about how they would save money. Let's start with saving money. I absolutely think the Liberals' unfair hydro plan, which the Conservatives have now endorsed, uh, is a fiscally responsible mess. It is the most expensive Band-Aid in Ontario's history. The financial accountability officer said it's gonna cost between 43 and $93 billion over the next two decades. Uh, I think we should get rid of it. It's, it's a plan that is essentially not going to solve why electricity prices are going up. It's gonna keep rates down a little bit right before the election and right after it, and then they're gonna skyrocket again in a couple of years. So let's solve that problem rather than put an expensive Band-Aid on it. Uh, ways that we can raise additional revenue. First of all, I, the Green Party believes that we should stop giving away our natural resources. Ontario has the lowest public return on mineral resources of any province in Canada. So even if we took that 1.5% return we have right now and raised it to 10%, which is slightly above Saskatchewan's rate, that would raise over a billion dollars a year. That is public wealth. That is wealth that can be used to pay down debt or to fund better social programs, better so health care, education, transit, better social services. And some people say, oh, well, if you raise the public return on that, those mining companies won't invest in Ontario. I call BS on that. Those minerals aren't going anywhere. It's not like a factory that you can pick up and move to Mexico or China. <laughs> the minerals are in Ontario. If they want access to the minerals, they should pay for that access for the benefit of the people of Ontario. Great question, Simon. Uh, Alan, you had uh, one other question for Mike with regards to infrastructure. I do. Uh, you know, with one thing with infrastructure, we've lost yeah. the uh, gas tax for rural municipalities if you yes. don't have transit. That's right. Uh, the, big, the big challenge for us, that was about 
mm-hmm. million dollar hit. Yeah. So, you know, our roads are going to pot and how do we do it? And I can't keep raising property taxes. That's and we right, have yeah. the highest property, Ontario's paying the highest property tax of all, all mm-hmm. provinces in mm-hmm. Canada. So we got to find another way, just as you just said yes. about revenue stream. So one thing I'm asking for is, and, and through AMO, we were asking for 1% of the HST, either mm-hmm. add it on or give it, guarantee it for what please you already have. Please don't add it income. on. For, I, I beg of you, the people, that, please don't add it on. Well, you know, you talk to people when their roads are a mess, yeah. and you talk about an infrastructure that's failing and we don't have the revenue. The original gas tax was developed to build rural Ontario and maintain it. Yeah. And where is it going today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I want a guaranteed revenue stream for us. So that's yes. about three and a half billion. We're about right. four billion in the hole yeah. each year we're falling back. But that is something that could help all municipalities move forward, not just Calvin and everyone. So if you were the yeah, premier, yeah. what would you say to the, uh, the mayor of Calvin? <laughs> well, as the mayor of Calvin knows, uh, <laughs> there's not a lot of traction on no, this one. Uh, you know that. And uh, so, so here's, here's the thing is, in our vision book, we've committed to finding a revenue sh- stream for municipalities. In our costed platform, we didn't deliver on that, Alan. So I have to be honest with you on that. And the reason being is, is we're not responsible. Like successive NDP, conservative, and liberal governments have created such a budget situation and a structural budget deficit that it is incredibly hard to figure out where you're going to find the fiscal capacity for that. And I don't think there's a lot of appetite for raising the HST right now. But the one thing we did do in our fiscal numbers was increase the gas tax, which I understand isn't the most popular thing to do in the world. On the other hand, the, you know, the oil and gas companies have us around the neck and they're jacking the prices up all the time. I'd like, and so we've done that partly to provide some additional revenue to free up for municipalities, not to the same level that you're asking for, but, but some, some additional revenue there. I also believe um, our plan around ramping up the availability of affordable housing units will benefit municipalities as well. Because as you know, municipalities are on the hook oftentimes for uh, affordable housing. And so having more provincial help in that regard will help. Uh, and then the other thing is, is, and is that uh, a big part of the pressure on property tax, I know this isn't gonna get to your infrastructure issue, but I'm looking at ways of how do we take the pressure off of property tax, is, is waste disposal. That's a huge part of your property tax base. And so we are gonna be fighting for um, changes. So when the Waste-Free Ontario Act regulations come in, we're gonna be pushing very hard for individual producer responsibility. So that way the companies that produce the waste are responsible for the cost of dealing with it to help alleviate that cost from municipality. I think that's a good down payment on helping um, municipalities with their infrastructure crunch, with their cash crunch, because we realize that raising property taxes isn't the way to go because it's a very regressive tax and we don't want to be pricing particularly seniors out of their homes as property values go up. So to add to that, I'm going to come back with a third question. I know I'm sure. allowed to, but I'm here. So <laughs> I'm going to ask that sure. question. So talk <laughs> about affordable player. housing and for seniors. And the challenge is if you look at it, here's some interesting data. Mm-hmm. 73% of the homeowners in Caledon are seniors yes. that own detached homes, three bedrooms or more. Yeah. They're empty nesters. Exactly. There's a revenue stream, or there's a stream there of housing. Mm-hmm. That's yes, a lot. That's a lot. 65% without a mortgage. Mm-hmm. But they would love to downsize when you do surveys. And the challenge is there's no place for them to go because yeah. that div- with the green belt driving the price of land up in this part yeah. of the area mm-hmm. is the excuse that it just become a bidding mm-hmm. war and they price mm-hmm. themselves out of the market. There's no way to build those small bungalows one story. Seniors aren't going to move in a three-story townhouse running right. up and down stairs. Yeah. They want something that's simple in life that they can enjoy, still get out, and they're our biggest volunteers. Mm-hmm. So how do we find get the development to make that stream work? Yeah. And the challenge you were talking about is the town municipalities changing bylaws. That is one. But the challenge is the province has taken exactly. over our planning. Exactly. Let us deal our planning. Yeah. We can save you a ton of money too, and yeah. give that back. Give that yeah. revenue back to me. Yeah. Well, that's why I was saying that. That's <laughs> why I was saying to you. We, we need the revenue in Ontario. I agree with giving the planning back to the municipalities, but there has there has to be you know there has to be a rub. It's a two way street. Oh, right? how would yeah. you react to that? That's yeah, yeah. an excellent question. So you know, on seniors, um, uh, an architect in Guelph, I think, has actually been doing some amazing design work around co-housing for seniors. So you would have like that single bungalow system and then you'd have shared space for 
like kitchen, living mm -hmm. space, whatever. Because another challenge seniors face is just loneliness, eh? And so a co what I love about the co-housing concept for seniors is, is you have your own place, a place you can call your own, but then you also have that shared space. And part of the challenge is, is you're right, the Planning Act uh, places limitations on that kind of innovation. Yeah. And so I want to see more of that kind of in innovation and I want to free up the rules to allow for that kind of innovation. I think innovation. there's a mixture of a lot of things for different types of seniors at different exactly. levels of life. That's right, But exactly. we got to somehow figure out how to do it because if we don't do it, we're at 36% now as seniors and mm -hmm. in, in, in 20 years, we're going to be over 60. Exactly. How are we, holy crumb, how are we going to handle that? Yeah. And all of a sudden we're going to have a housing cr market crash and it's because mm -hmm. there'll be so many detached homes that no one no one wants, on, wants. <laughs> yeah. so I think we have to be progressive to think yeah. differently yeah, how exactly. do we work on that together and it just we're on deaf ears That's Alan Thompson yeah. the mayor of Caledon you're more than welcome to stay if you want to sit here you're, you're more than welcome <laughs> to stay and, and involve yourself with this Alan Thompson the mayor of Caledon also we've got Mike Schreiner the leader of the Ontario Green Party if you want to ask a question you want to participate you can go, go to facebook.com forward slash live town hall so let's go to a couple of questions here Mike sure. um, we have a Kevin who says most people seem convinced that a carbon tax is a cash grab how do you respond to that well it depends on how you price carbon pollution so the Green Party was well, it a tax grab no it doesn't have to be not at all so what the Green Party is proposing is a plan called carbon fee and dividend we would put a price on pollution all the money that would be raised would go back to the people of Ontario as a dividend okay, check. I, that's a, if I may, I, I love you to death, but it, it, you're, it's still a tax. If I'm paying how a carbon... How is it a tax, though, Michael, if you pay to pollute, but then you get a check back? Like, how is that a tax? If I, if I go to the gas pumps and you're going to say to me that you're going to put a carbon tax of one or two cents a liter, yeah. that's increasing the cost of my gas. It that's is. That's a tax. But if is you get no a dividend... Is there no way that we can realize something <laughs> somewhere else? I mean, Doug Ford talks about efficiencies. He's talking about, what, 4% across the board of efficiencies. Um, and Andrew Horvath says uh, people are going to lose their jobs. They closed uh, 28 hospitals and 6,000 teachers. And, and Kathleen Wynne says, how do, you, how do you envision that? You can't add more money, can you? Michael, do you believe in markets? Yes, I do. I believe in markets, too. All is carbon fee and dividend is, is an efficient market mechanism to reduce carbon pollution. It is not a tax grab to government. It puts money in your pocket. As a matter of fact, most of the calculations would show that people with, with modest and middle incomes would actually come out ahead. Mm -hmm. Because the people with the biggest carbon footprint are the people with the biggest, most expensive cars means. and the biggest, most expensive houses. They're the ones who consume the most. They'll, they will pay the most into the carbon uh, pricing system. Dividend check goes back equally to everybody. Mm -hmm. And then you can take that dividend check and you can spend it on things that can help you conserve energy. And then you even make more money on it or save uh, more money on it. Question from Jacqueline. What do the Greens think of Brampton's new vision, especially concerning the Etobicoke Creek runoff and river walk? Uh, well, you know, the vision I've seen for Brampton that I feel is the most inspiring is the Brampton 2040 vision, where you're looking at having different hubs uh, around Brampton uh, to sort of create that community hub feeling that you have right here in downtown Brampton. Because I think one of the, peop one of the uh, feedback I hear from people in Brampton, and I hear this in Mississauga as well, mm -hmm. is you don't have that sense of community feeling that you have in a place like Caledon where you have those sort of downtown commercial centers and I think the Brampton 2040 plan where you're starting to build out more of those community hubs that create shared public space for people to come together is a vision that um, should be complemented and we need more of that vision. Um, we had a question here uh, live from Alan Thompson, but let's now go to a question from Bonnie Crombie, the uh, mayor of Brampton. Uh, she submitted us two questions. Her first question is... Mrs. Saga's Crombie. Mrs. Saga, what did I say? Brampton. I'm sorry, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Freudian stuff. i got lots of papers here. I love Bonnie. Um, Mrs. Saga owns $8.9 billion of infrastructure, mm -hmm. and every year it ages and gets more costly yeah. to maintain. Bonnie continues in saying, like all cities, they only receive about $0.08 cents of every dollar collected in taxes but they own 66% of the infrastructure in the country. Uh, that's what they need uh, to have committed from a provincial partner to help as uh, a building, uh, to helping to 
maintain their infrastructure. If elected, will your party honor the infrastructure commitments made by the previous government to build the fully funded Here Ontario LRT fund and the improvements to the Trillium Hospital and maintain and enhance gas tax programs and fund 320 new culturally appropriate long-term care beds. That's Bonnie Crombie, the mayor of Mississauga. Absolutely. And the platform we put out today, as a matter of fact, I did an announcement in Mississauga today yep. announcing our support for the Here Ontario LRT. Uh, by the way, I, I really wish it that Brampton had proven it coming up all the way up into Brampton as well. And that's I know that was a, I know that was a I know it was a controversial comes. issue, yep. but yeah, uh, you know what we it, will be, it will be it will be municipally. I think we need more transit, not less transit, right. um, because you know we have people in the GTA stuck in their cars for 80 minutes a day. We have the worst commute times in North America. We have to do something about it. I mean, you know, the added cost to just shipping goods through Toronto now is $650 million a year. Hmm. We lose $11.5 billion in productivity. Absolutely, Mayor Crombie, we support more investment in transit. And in our platform release today, we were honest about how to pay for it. And um, I'm going to tell you how I do politics differently, Michael. I'm going to tell you how I pay for it, and I know it's controversial in Brampton, but we have to have, or in Peel Region as a whole, but we have to have an honest conversation about this. Because here's the bottom line. For decades, politicians have been promising more transit infrastructure, right. and we haven't been building it. And what we build, we're mostly financing onto our children's credit cards, which is why we have these ballooning deficit numbers you're talking yep. about. So we will support the expert recommendations from the Board of Trade, the Golden Report, and the Metrolink Report to bring in road pricing on 400 series highways to drive into Toronto. I know that's controversial. Again, it's a market mechanism to efficiently allocate road space. So I would actually argue it's a market very market is, friendly. Is, is, is it's it a, a very market friendly approach. For another tool, right? It, but it is market friendly approach. Yeah. Used in the United States a lot. That can raise $1.4 billion that can go into fund transit. And not just transit infrastructure, but also to help cover operating costs to keep to help municipalities keep uh, transit more affordable. We would also bring in a $2 a day commercial parking levy in, in the GTA or in Toronto. That would raise an additional $2 billion. That's how we can start funding transit infrastructure without ballooning our budget deficit. And here's the bottom line. If our great-grandparents hadn't put the money down to build Niagara Falls, and it was expensive at the time, and it was incredibly controversial, Sir Adam Beck went around this province and sold it to people. That produced the cheap power that built Ontario's economy in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I think we have an obligation to our children and grandchildren to build the infrastructure that's going to build prosperity in our economy in the 21st century. And broadband infrastructure, which we've already talked about, and transit infrastructure is going to be critical to doing that. That's the kind of legacy I want to leave my kids. And I'm willing to have the courage to have an honest conversation with people about it, even though I know it's controversial. Uh, Madam Mayor Linda Jeffrey, the mayor of Brampton, uh, submitted a question. She said, Brampton is a rapidly growing city. It's the second fastest in the country. Their population uh, will reach about 900,000 in 2041. Currently, the mayor of Brampton recently wrote an open letter to the Minister of Health about the overcrowding at Brampton Civic Hospital. The letter is... Uh, include you'll be able to see it on Brampton Focus. Uh, she spoke about the fact that our healthcare infrastructure and operational uh, funding is not keeping pace with Brampton's explosive growth. What would the Green Party do to address these healthcare issues? Yeah, Michael, you know what? Every party's talking about putting more money into hospitals, and we do need to put more money in hospitals. What the Green Party wants to do, though, is to take a long term vision and transform our healthcare system by investing more in preventing illness and promoting health in addition to just treating sickness. In Brampton's case, a lot of what's driving hospital overcrowding is the explosive growth and infra uh, healthcare infrastructure isn't keeping Servable, up with it. Serviceable it's a medical huge, It's huge in Brampton. Yeah. Across a lot, most of Ontario, and including Brampton, part of what's putting additional pressure on our hospitals is because we don't have proper mental health care services available in our communities, 
a number of people who can't access mental health services are ending up in hospitals. That's one of your pillars, right? It is one of our pillars. That is exactly why one of the reasons we are putting in such a historic investment mm -hmm. in mental health and addictions. I've talked to so many uh, uh, hospital executives and emergency room uh, directors who have said, our biggest challenge right now is not enough long-term care beds. So we have a lot of seniors in hospital who can't access a long-term care bed. So we have to, to build out more long-term care mm -hmm. beds. And we have a number of people who, who, ha who are in hospital for, to receive care around mental health and addictions. They would be better cared for in the community. They'd be better cared for at a primary health care level. And that care would be much less expensive. So yes, we are putting in a major historic investment. We believe it's going to have long-term payback and, and lower costs for our hospital sector, which doesn't mean we don't, we still need to build more hospitals, but we also have to relieve pressure on hospitals by transforming our healthcare system. Today, Andrea Horvath announced in Brampton that, uh, and I quote, uh, she says, today I announced we will be building a new hospital in Brampton. People in Brampton have been raising concerns about the crisis in our area hospitals for years. We're excited about this commitment and how it will benefit one of the fastest growing communities in Ontario. So. Uh, Andrew Horvath is uh, committed to uh, Michael, building. it would have been nice if she'd come by after making the announcement and she could have joined us I here. guess she was busy. I mean, <laughs> uh, it, it, it happens. It yeah. happens. I mean, hey, uh, I appreciate uh, you, Mike Schreiner, for coming out today. and My pleasure. Uh, and answering the questions and interacting with our folks. We encourage you to go to facebook.com forward slash live town hall and you can post your question. Let's go to another question. Scott here has a question. He says, uh, what are you going to do about dental drugs and people that need it? Yes. So in our budget projections we put out today, um, we embrace funding for expansion of dental care, expansion of pharma care, mm -hmm. and increased funding around health care um, at the same level that the Liberals have proposed in their budget. Okay? But because we have found additional savings, which I've already talked about, and additional revenue tools, which I've already talked about, yep we can actually produce a budget deficit that is one third of the liberal deficit. And it's because we're willing to have an honest conversation. So it's easy for a politician to s sit here and say, we're gonna spend more money on this, we're gonna spend more money on that, we're gonna spend more money on this. Um, it's much more difficult for a politician to say, yes, we're gonna do that, but we're also gonna save some money here mm -hmm. and we're gonna raise some additional revenue here. That to me is the fiscally responsible approach and um, yes, we want better public services. Yes, we want more money for health care and education. Well, that's, and what they, that's what the NDP and, and the Liberals are but promising. But we're right? telling you how we would yeah. pay for it. That's the difference. Uh, here's a question, uh, Anna, which you may chime in. Um, uh, there was uh, the, the highway on the top of the GTA, the West mm -hmm. Corridor, yes. uh, on <laughs> top of Vaughan and uh, Caledon. Uh, it was to basically relieve the congestion of the 401 mm -hmm. and the 407, and the Liberals uh, canceled it. Uh, question to you, Alan Thompson. Um, how devastating was that to Caledon? And follow up to you, what would be your reaction to that as a, as a leeway to the 407 and a 401 and potentially yeah. another tool to raise funds? I'll go to you first, Alan. Well, first of all, I don't think it's uh, really dead as we see it. They define the line of what a highway corridor is, and it's 660 feet. Um, per <laughs> personally, I think the original plan that the Conservatives had years ago was run the highway over to Guelph and down to Fort Erie mm -hmm. and run the Keel St Street CN Rail along with it. Mm -hmm. It's a goods movement corridor. They're looking at expanding from Perry Sound to Sudbury and they asked the industry what they thought about it going to, from two lane to four lane and they said their biggest problem is 401 and 400. That's where they're talking about. They weren't even talking about the extension of the highway when they're doing the EA. They're all talking, this is the problem. Yeah. Everything that's got to go Western Canada, whatever, has got to go through Toronto. Most successful city in the world has ring roads. Yes. We don't have a complete one at all. And uh, the QEW is maybe the only one you could really call. The 401 goes through. We need a ring road, especially for the GTA. So how devastating was it? When it is. It is a, it's a setback. Um, but to me, as I always say, things happen for a reason and I'm hoping common sense will prevail and uh, everybody come back to the table and look for the greater good. Um, it doesn't mean cars or whatever, it's still goods movement as you say. Mm -hmm. 1.8 billion dollars worth of goods move through Peel every day. 2.3 billion is generated every day. 48 percent of it comes out of Pearson alone. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a growing market. 
So that's why you're paying to have your suitcase to go on because you're competing against the goods that are co and go go coming in and going out. So the challenge is, it is very important. To me, it's a setback for not having a vision of what the whole GTA is going to be and what it is. So Mike, there's a, a, a yep. mayor in, in, in Peel mm -hmm. uh, talking about a disappointment and a slight setback. What would you comment with regards to the Greens to that? Yeah, well, first of all, Alan and I have had this conversation yeah. <laughs> almost every year. He gives a delegation to me yeah. at either Roma or um, AMO, which is for the municipal yeah. leaders. And um, this is where I've said, you know, I got the utmost respect for Alan. And sometimes we disagree, <laughs> and I respectfully disagree, and many times we do agree. Yeah. And, and on this one, um, I want to prioritize transit over new highways. I think the first step is getting more road, more, more cars off the road mm -hmm. so we can free up road capacity for shipping goods. Uh, so my priority is transit. I've been very clear with Alan on that over the years. But I do think we can have a respectful conversation about how we create intermodal shipping of goods, particularly connecting rail and trucks, which I think is going to be increasingly important, and especially for this region, given the rail yards we have in this region, well, funny you it's going to be that. essential. I've had an opportunity to talk to Alan at great lengths with regards to that, and there are some CN rails that he can run up the side. We were talking about that in one yes, of our previous... Alan and I have talked I mean, about that's, that That's too. an interesting compromise, and it's not necessarily disturbing the environment. It's running parallel, right? Yeah, so I think there's some opportunities for that kind yeah. of conversation to happen. And, um, and again, it's like, this is where we need the vision. I think this is where we need a broader transportation vision of how we're going to plan this region. And I think politicians need to be a part of that conversation, mm -hmm. but I think transportation planners need to lead it. Because part of the problem we're having with transportation planning, whether it's transit or roads, is the politicians keep getting in the way. <laughs> we start building subway stops where they don't belong. Perfect are we example is Brampton. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I Mississauga <laughs> brought it right to steel yeah. so it stopped because Brampton didn't want to approve it. Yeah, right? yeah. Or you have the transportation, oh, wow. former transportation minister building, you know, stop, go stops in his riding when all the experts said not to put it there. So we need to reduce the amount of politically motivated transit and transportation planning. Okay, let's go to a couple of questions here. Darcy wants to know, how do you support new Canadians who start many small businesses? Yeah, you know what? I feel like at Queen's Park, we have two parties of big business and one party of no business. And we need a party that's going to champion small businesses. And that's the Green Party of Ontario. We are the only party calling for lowering payroll taxes on small businesses. Mm -hmm. We would increase the employer health tax exemption from currently 450000 in payroll to a $1 million in payroll, providing immediate cash flow relief for small businesses. And I know many new Canadians are small business owners, yep. so I appreciate that particular angle on the question. But that would provide immediate cash flow relief for those small businesses to hire more workers and to pay them a higher wage. And I've been very clear. I support paying, paying workers a higher minimum wage, but I also support fair taxes for small businesses so they have cash flow relief to pay that higher wage. Do you wage. support the minimum wage going up in uh, I 2019? Do. I do. So I, do. I, do. I do. I do combined with lowering payroll taxes on small businesses okay. so they can afford the higher minimum wage. And this is where I feel like it's so important to talk about doing politics differently. You know, you have the conservative leaders saying, you know what, workers don't deserve a higher wage and people working full time, maybe working for poverty level wages. But you also have the premier pitting workers against small business owners. And I'm saying, why do we have to have that kind of wedge politics that divide people to harvest votes? Why can't we come up with win-win solutions, paying workers a living wage and providing fair taxes for small businesses so they can afford to pay a living wage? Final question from uh, Bonnie Crummy, the mayor of Mississauga. She asks, in your opinion, what's the single biggest issue that the Peel region will face over the next five years? If elected, how would you address it? Great question. And yes. thank you, Bonnie, for your questions. Thank you, Mayor Crombie. Uh, can I do two? Because I think they're partly related. Sure. I think it's housing and transit. Housing affordability is a huge issue throughout the entire region. And we've already talked about how so many young families can't afford to have a place to call home. Mm -hmm. And I've already given you my solutions on yes, that. Sir. But, uh, and then obviously transit. Like we absolutely have to start connecting our communities with affordable, reliable, accessible transit. Because this idea of, you know, being in your car for 80, 90 minutes 
the commute to work is not sustainable economically, nor is it sustainable environmentally. I mean, our biggest source of carbon pollution, if you want to talk about the best way to avoid paying a carbon tax, is to actually take transit, take transit and not drive your car. But you need to have transit that you yes. can take. Uh, so I'm going to go to the final question from uh, Mayor uh, Linda Jeffrey, the mayor of Brampton. And uh, interesting, Alan, because you'll appreciate this too, and I think this is a very cool question. Um, only six of the 10 Brampton councillors sit at regional council, so they're each representing about 98,000 Brampton residents at the region. Mm -hmm. Mississauga has full participation where all 10 councillors are at the region council, each representing 72,000 Mississauga residents. And Caledon, with four councillors participating, representing about 16,000 Caledon <laughs> residents. Uh, what would the Green Party do to address this inequality? I'm going to let you, Alan, jump in on top because you make it clear. You're a wonderful ambassador for Peel. Uh, this is Linda's question, but I think you could probably make a, a good stand uh, to add a little something to that. Well, what I'm going to say is uh, there's a big difference between representation by pop, but in the Municipal Act, it's representation by area. And yeah. if you look at that, yeah. uh, we're still a big municipality of 72,000 mm -hmm. people. So our representation is, is right, compatible to everywhere else. It isn't just about people. It's land area. It's about environment. If you're talking about the planet, you need representation of people that But the only person that could change it could be the premier. Is that correct? That, that, is, that correct. is correct. Yes. And the challenge is I don't disagree with, the, with Brampton being urban. It needs an urban representation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm the rural component, but I still need what I, what's fair for me as a rural municipality. But I do believe Brampton is very deserving of what they're asking for. I have How no would issue. you react to that, Mike? Yeah, well, I think Brampton needs more representation. And part of the challenge here has been just how fast Brampton has grown. And mm -hmm. their representation on regional council hasn't grown as fast as, as their population. Um, but I think Alan does make a good point. And um, th there needs to be more It's Alan and Mayor Jeffrey. And Mayor Jeffrey, <laughs> yes. Um, there needs to be a balance there mm -hmm. because um, rural municipalities, otherwise we're going to start seeing a huge shift where so much of the political power base in Ontario is going to be in Toronto and its immediate surrounding region. And, and it should be because a lot of people live there, so they should have a lot of representation. But if you balance it too much in that direction, then you have wide swaths of the province that is underrepresented mm -hmm. and has some unique needs that aren't being talked about at the table. Well, we're growing. And we need everybody at that we're table. We're all growing. I mean, for 107 in the legislature to 124, that's absolute evidence that it we're is. growing. It is, absolutely. Uh, a comment from Jason, he said, this might be the Green Party's time to break out. That's yes. what uh, Jason says. Uh, Rene has a question. He says, uh, what is the Green Party's plan to end racial profiling and discrimination? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't think anyone should have to walk down the street and worried about being pulled over because of the color of their skin. So carding, what's your, what's so your position carding? We are carding? absolutely opposed to carding. Okay. We think it should stop, period. No more carding. I know the Liberals have brought in regulations, but carding is still happening. We believe it should stop. Uh, what about safe injection sites? That yeah. was a big thing. You have the, the yeah. Liberals who are uh, proponents of that. They feel mm -hmm. that it is a, um, an ability to treat people and give them a safe place to inject, whereas uh, at this point the Conservatives are saying that they're not necessarily um, interested in doing that. They want to stop addiction and help it. Where, where does the Green sit? Yeah, you know what? Actually, one of the I'm blessed to be from Guelph, and the police chief in Guelph, Jeff DeRuder, has said, we are not going to arrest our way out of the mental health and addictions crisis that we're facing. And I want to work with people like Chief DeRuder to develop harm reduction methods. In Guelph, we have, with the, and the police have been partners in this, mm -hmm. a van that goes around and provides harm reduction care because the evidence has shown that that is the best way to transition people away from their addictions by providing them with the health care and the services they need and the access to those health care and services. I think services. the mayor of Vancouver would agree with you. He would. He would. <laughs> um, in, uh, in Brampton, particularly uh, in the Peel region, it's very expensive for auto insurance, but in Brampton, it's particularly expensive. Yeah. There are some uh, extenuating circumstances that the insurance companies always use. It is your postal code, more, uh, more crime, more fraud, more accidents. That's why it costs more because it's based on your postal code. And many people in Brampton uh, dispute that and have rallying, have been rallying the current government mm -hmm. to make some changes. Where does a Green Party sit on insurance rate, particularly in Brampton? 
Yeah, well, we need to lower auto insurance rates, but we have to get, we have to start addressing what is the chief cause of it. And we also need to make sure that as we lower rates, we actually don't lower people's benefits. Because one of the um, uh, things I've been, I've disagreed with the current government is, is they've brought in a few rate reductions, been very few, but it's also been offset by benefit reductions. And so you don't want to be in a situation where if you are in an accident and you need those benefits, you don't want to learn when it's too late that your benefits are actually reduced. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we do have to look at things like fraud. We have to look at things like, um, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we um, build safer roads, safer communities, safer streets, um, because that will actually reduce accidents. Uh, when we talk about uh, Hydro One, we talk about currently Ontario owns about 47% of uh, Hydro One. Uh, when we look at the amount of money that's being made by public service workers, uh, in 1997, uh, from 1997 to 2018, mm -hmm. the uh, employees, government employees, have uh, increased 43%. There are now 403,000 government mm -hmm. Employees, uh, Hydro One uh, Mayo Schmidt is making six point two million dollars. Supposedly, there was something that j was just recently passed that if he was uh, ousted, he would get a ten million dollar severance package. When Mike, you look at the amount of money, it's it's about thirteen point thirteen point seven thirteen point four percent more people who work for the government than the private sector. How would you handle something like Hydro and Schmidt and and government workers? Uh, how would you handle that question? Well, first of all, the Liberals made a huge mistake privatizing Hydro One. I thought it was a horrible decision. Uh, and you know what? It was Would a decision. back? Well, here's the thing is I'd love to see us get back to 50% ownership so we at least have a majority stake. 51. 51, exactly. We're 47 right We're now. We're 47. I'd like to yep. get us back to 51. I think to buy it all back and to spend $6 billion at this point is probably not going to be the fiscally responsible approach. And I, I hate saying that because I thought selling it off in the first place was a huge mistake. But at this point, the Liberals have already made that mistake. So let's look at a majority stake in it. But buying it all back, I'm not sure that's the best use of $6 billion. What about Mayo Schmidt when it comes to When it comes to uh, compensation, our, our platform has been uh, we should cap compensation levels for public sector CEOs to twice the premier's salary. I think it's ridiculous that the CEO of Hydro One is being paid $6 million when the CEO of Quebec Hydro is being paid about $500,000, which would be right around our cap level. That's good money. I think if you're going to work for the public sector, especially when you get benefits and the types of pensions, then, you know, a six-figure income around 500 seems about right. I don't think you'd well, be I think five the million. Quebec, the Quebec, uh, the president of the Quebec Hydro is about 462,000. Yeah, it was. Something. That's why I said so. Between so, four and five hundred. Like yeah, exactly. Slightly so under five hundred. We got about uh, about ten minutes left. We encourage you if you have any questions uh, for Al Thompson. He's here. The, the mayor Calvin <laughs> is here as well. A uh, wonderful amb ambassador for PLA. Thank you for sticking around. I know you're very busy. Appreciate you coming here personally. And Mike Schreiner, the, the um, leader of the Green Party. Uh, you can reach us at facebook.com forward slash live town hall. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the Green Party people in the Peel region here that you're a little excited about. You, you're having um, a full field of candidates. There's 124 seats up for grabs. Mm -hmm. You've got someone in every riding. Who in the Peel region should we be looking for in the Green Party? Yeah, well, we have a number of strong candidates in the Peel region, and I, I don't want to list them all okay, off. Okay, that's fair. Because it's going to take a long time. But <laughs> I will, because Alan Thompson is here, I Pick will one. give a shout out to Laura Campbell, who is our candidate in Dufferin Caledon. Uh, small business owner. Um, it's the only PC writing. <laughs> <laughs> that well, there is that too, I guess. But um, but uh, uh, you know, Alan, I would say you've got you know well, you've got a strong candidate there. The Greens have always done well in Dufferin Cowan, and it's of of all the writings in Pill Region, it's the one that we've historically done the best in. And I think it's an amazing to have um, a young a young mother who's also a small business owner uh, be such a strong candidate for us. Uh, one other uh, topic that has come up is, is sex education. Uh, in Brampton, it's been quite a hot topic. Uh, yes. There's been some people who were very upset because they felt it, uh, it took uh, students too soon, too fast. Others felt that uh, it needed to be said in, in a, in a non-judgmental, non-religious, uh, more um, 
how should one say, clinical way. Um, we have um, uh, the progressive conservatives are saying that they want to readjust it. We have the liberals who are saying that they're happy with it. I don't remember what the NDP said. What, what would be your position with regards to sex education as it currently exists? Would you alter it? Would you, what would you do to it? Well, first of all, can I just say that um, so, on so many issues, the con new conservative leader seems to want to take Ontario backwards instead of move us forward. And this is one of those issues, is climate policies are another one, is economic policies are another one. I think we have to embrace the future with confidence and compassion so we can li leave a livable legacy for our children. When it comes to um, sexual health, I want my children to understand their bodies, understand relationships between people, and feel safe. <clears throat> so if they feel like they've been violated in any way, if they feel like sexual misconduct has taken place, they know how to identify it, they know how to articulate it, and they know who to go to to talk about it. And that is a huge part of the revamped sex education curriculum, mm -hmm. and I support that. I also support the fact that if you're a parent, and if you don't want your child to be in class during those, those, when those are days that are being taught, that you can take your child out of class and keep your child at home. That's a parent's decision, but I think there's public good that comes from teaching people about their bodies and about their relationship with other people around their bodies. Uh, with the current United States uh, looking at refugees and tightening their borders, um, refugee services say that we're getting uh, approximately 400 asylum seekers every day. Uh, coming into Canada. Uh, there's already some uh, 6,373 asylum seekers from Nigeria, Colombia, Pakistan, and Haiti. And in 2017, the RCMP said that they intercepted 20,000 illegal claimants. And the total number was about 53,000 uh, claimants seeking asylum. What would be your position? Because Quebec is now saying they're, they're, um, they're supporting too much of the cost and they want to come and give some of the rich refugees, which are crossing at the mm -hmm. Quebec border, to Ontario. What would be your position if you were elected Premier of Ontario with regards to asylum seekers? Well, first of all, I think Ontario should be a welcoming place. And we have welcomed people from around the world to Ontario and, and, and to Canada in general. And I want us to continue to be a welcoming place. I think part of the vibrancy of Peel Region and particularly Brampton and Mississauga is its diversity. And the fact that we have welcomed so many diverse Canadians, or diverse people from around the world, sorry, to Canada. Um, I think the federal government, if we're bringing in more immigration, needs to support the provinces from a financial perspective and municipalities from a financial, uh, financial perspective to be able to provide the services to service um, immigrants, whether they're refugees or non-refugee claimants. Um, I want to, just as we uh, slowly start to wrap this up, I want to give you, uh, Alan, an opportunity to uh, uh, wrap up, ask a question, uh, make a comment. Again, I want to thank you for being here, Alan. Uh, you thank stayed you. for the whole thing. You, had, you just had to submit questions. <laughs> Everybody was invited, but you showed up. So uh, from a personal standpoint, and on behalf of Brampton Focus and all the people in Peel, and I know the people in Calden appreciate yeah. you being here, I just want to give you an opportunity to ask a final question and wrap your end of it up. Well, one is, in Calden, we have a lot of small businesses. Yes. And they're the ones that support our sports teams or our Absolutely. community. And it's very important. And I'm glad to see you take a leadership. But here's another challenge that small businesses mm -hmm. have that I hear constantly is we talk about free trade with the United States, but we don't have free trade among our borders. I know. Are you, like, I mean, yeah. the, how do we as Ontario, who's, the big en who's really still the big engine, how Little do we hitter. champion to break those barriers down? And I, and I think it's more fear of letting go. I, do, I think we all can benefit better you know, with, uh, with the uh, freedom to move things back and forth from one, one yeah. province to the other. Yeah. You I, I, I absolutely agree with you, Alan. I think we need more trade. And I just, uh, um, between Certain provinces, small business, that's particularly what's small really businesses, hurting. because, you know, a lot of small businesses are, are not going to access international markets as much. No. I mean, there are a number of small businesses that do. I mean, really small businesses do amazing. But the majority of small businesses won't, right? But accessing provincial markets, absolutely essential. And I think one of the most important ways in which Ontario should do that right now is to start buying low-cost water power from Quebec. And I know the Conservatives have come out against this, but here's the bottom line. The Liberals and Conservatives both want to spend 14 to $32 billion 
rebuilding the Darlington nuclear station. Yeah. OPG wants a 180% price increase over the next decade to finance the rebuilding. We can buy low cost water power from Quebec for one third of the price. Why aren't we doing that? At the same time, we should be selling Quebec, Ontario, you know, good craft beer, good BQA wines. Like there's a whole host of restrictions around cross-border yeah. trade that we should we should break those restrictions down. Absolutely. Mike, as you see the uh, elections starting to materialize, there's been quite a surge uh, from the NDP. They've uh, they've taken up a strong second position. Yes. Uh, we heard today that uh, Andrew Horvath said that she would not uh, consider at this point anyways any level of a coalition government between um, the NDP and the Liberals. Mm -hmm. um, there is a survey out that says uh, it's a 90 percent chance supposedly that the Conservatives are going to take a majority. Um, how do you look at the election? Here we are May 14th, it's June 7th that it's right. happening. Uh, what's your take on the election to this point? So first of all, there's a lot of days left in this yeah. election. So I, I would would not put a lot of stock in any polls right now. The, and, and you know the stock answer, of course, is the most important poll is June seventh, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing at the door, and I'm hearing this in Guelph, which is my home, and you know I've knocked on thousands of doors in Guelph, but I've also been traveling the province as well. Yep. And so many people tell me they are sick and tired of the three status quo parties at Queens Park. The debate we saw on City News is exactly why people are sick of it. And what the Green Party is saying is, is the only way to change the political status quo at Queen's Park is to vote for a new party with a new vision and an entire new way of doing politics. Which brings me to and my last can I, question. Can I just really quick on that is, yep. elected Greens across the country, three in British Columbia now, two in Prince Edward Island and one in New Brunswick, as well as Elizabeth May federally, mm -hmm. are showing that you can do politics differently. And I think our proposal to support um, minimum wage workers and local businesses is exactly the kind of win-win solution the people of Ontario are looking for. Which brings me to my final question. It's a closing comment uh, from uh, the leaders. And since you're the only leader who's here, <laughs> I give you an opportunity to talk to the people in Peel and all those watching virtually and uh, tell them uh, why they should vote for the Green Party. Mike Schreiner. Yeah, I would say to people, you are not stuck. So many people feel stuck right now. They don't want to vote for the current party that's been governing the province for the last 15 years and they feel have not done a good job governing the province nor do they want to vote for a Doug Ford led conservative party a conservative party that's shown that it can't even govern itself over the last couple months and or the NDP which is a wall on so many important issues particularly around our economy you don't have to stick with one of the three status quo parties you can vote for a new party with a new vision and a whole new way of doing politics. You can vote for a future that you can believe in. I'm so tired of people saying, you know what, I have to vote out of fear against something. You know what, you'll never get the government you want unless you vote for the vision you want, the policies you want, the party that you want. So please do not feel stuck. Elected Greens across the country have shown that we can do politics differently in this country. That's the kind of people-powered change Greens will deliver to Queen's Park, and we will put f honesty, integrity, and policies that put people first ahead of our own political self-interest. On June 7th, you can vote for what you believe in, vote Green. Mike Schreiner, leader of the Ontario Green Party, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, I really absolutely. respect you for being here. Um, as you may or may not know, we invited all the party leaders to attend, but they had previous engagements. And uh, as they say, people who care uh, show up. On behalf of the uh, 1.4 million people of the region, appeal like to thank Alan Thompson for being here, asking your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Also, some Bonnie tough Crombie, questions too. Uh, Bonnie Crombie, uh, Mayor of Mississauga, and Linda Jeffrey also posted questions. So thank you to those two mayors because they care about the people in their city as well. Uh, Alan Thompson, I already said. Uh, I want to thank uh, also the people from Brampton Focus and Live Town Hall, uh, Don McDonald McLeod, Fazil Khan, and Paul Vicente. My name is Michael Leisher Bond. It's been a pleasure being with you. We will be coming to you as the election starts to get a little closer with uh, all kinds of different candidates. So we look forward to hearing from you. Please leave us a message on our Facebook or on BramptonFocus.com. It was a pleasure. Thank you for watching and thanks for participating. And don't forget to vote June 7th.